to God, I greet you in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Silence, you have overcome them. Those challenges, you have overcome them. Those money issues, you have overcome them. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. something. Our God is so faithful. Our God is so real. Our God can never miss his word. He can never lie. Our God is true. Welcome everyone. This is the third day of our conference, The Experience. My name is Linda Sakala, Chair Lady of CLC, Women of Excellence, Malaysia. Before I begin, let me acknowledge our parents in South Africa, Dr. Bishop Mono and Mom Pastor Tina Mono, as well as our resident pastors here in Malaysia and the hosts of this conference, Pastor David and Twiza Mono, also known as Pastor D and Pastor T. Allow me to say a special thank you to all our speakers for this conference, as well as CLC leadership and to each and every one of you that is tuned in. So before I hand over the mic to the uh, speaker for today, or before we get into the men word, allow me to share a word with you just for the next few minutes while we get ready for the men word. I have titled my teaching today, Putting the Word to Work. And I am reading from James 1, 22 to 25, and I'll read. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says, uh, sorry, I'll start again. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man that looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do so, not forgetting what he has heard, 
but doing it will be blessed in what he does. And that is the reading today. Um, I, I read that from the New International Version. And to me, when I read this scripture, I feel Paul is describing the different types of Christians that we have today. Now, I have listed three, and I'm going to go with you. The first Christian, I believe, that is there based on this is the decorative Christian. You're a Christian just by title for you to be identified where, you know, you're given a checklist. What do you identify as? You say Christian, and that is it. Or maybe you were born in a Christian family, and that's how you're a Christian. But you and the word, there is no connection. You may not even be interested. It's just a title. Then we have the second one that Paul is addressing here, the listener. You are in church every time. We are having a conference. It's seven days. You will probably log in for the seven days. But when you hear the word, sometimes it will even excite you. It might ignite some sense of feeling that, oh, this is for me. But once the broadcast is over today or even once the seven days is gone, that word just leaves your life. Oh, it will just settle at the bottom. No change whatsoever. Oh, but we have a third type. One that listens to the word. Does what the word says. By the time you are done, it's like you and the word are one. There is no difference. You are the moving word, the living word. And that is what each and every one of us needs to strive to be. I mean, I love our theme for the year as CLC. It is saying, experiencing the faithfulness of God. And our, our conference is dubbed the experience. I got so excited. I think most of us know probably what faithfulness is. But let's just, what is an experience? And you know, if you just do a quick Google search, it, it gave me three definitions that I really like. One, it says, it's a practical contact with observation of facts or events. It is an encounter. And my favorite, it says, it is an event or an occurrence which leaves an impression on somebody. So today I ask you, how have you experienced God? And you can only experience him by doing the word. I mean, if you say you're a Christian, you're born again, can people see that fr from your conduct? You know, if you walk around, somebody should be able to see Genesis 1 verse 1 in you. Somebody should be able to see Proverbs 31 woman just by the way you conduct yourself. So somebody will ask, how do I do the word? Or how do I put the word into practice? You need to have an action plan. You need to be intentional about the things of God. Every time you hear a message, you should have an action plan that will help you to bring that word to life. Because if you don't, everything you hear will be like motivational speeches or like stories about back in the days, this is how it was. It will not be real to you. But when you apply the word, I tell you, then you experience the faithfulness of God. When you apply the word, then you know what it means when we say God is faithful. Because you will know that it is not your own doing, but the doing of the Lord. I want to tell you there's something I've picked up since I read this verse. Every time I hear a sermon or anything that pertains to the things of God, even in my personal life, if I attend a workshop on finances, if I attend even just a workshop on career, right at the end of all the notes I write, I put down an action plan, something practical that I will do to make this word come alive in my life. So it's seven days right now of this conference, two days down. It's not too late. Wherever you've written your notes for the past two days, go back, put an action plan for the remaining five days. What is it you're going to do to make the sermon that will be preached become a living word in your life? Because it is only when you do that. You know, if I tell you that when I had this 
You know, this verse for us was a theme in the ladies' group that I'm in. And when I heard it, it just gave me so much joy. And I can tell you that I will forever remember James 1. Because now I can say it to others. I can use it to talk to others about what it means. And that's the impression God has left in me. I am now leaving James 1, 22. I do not just want to be a listener. And so I urge you today, do not just listen. Don't be one that will log in seven days, but will not leave with any word. Or that God will not leave an impression on you through his word. And now I want to encourage somebody out there. I think most times we say, oh, you know, Christians, they preach some merry-go-lucky kind of gospel. They don't know what I've been through. Do you know that it is in your most difficult moment that you need to put the word to work? It is in trying times that you need to bring God even closer than ever before. I have three questions for you. When you're faced with a challenge or in difficult situations, do you run to God or you run away from him? Do you blame God for what is going on in your life? How do you behave when you are faced with a challenge? Because how you react in those moments will let you know whether you're putting the word to work or not. It's like university. And you know, you study, you can pass the test, but there's that final exam. And if you don't clear it, no matter how many A's you got in the past, it will not count. So when the test of life comes, will you put the word to work? Will Jesus still leave an impression on your life when you're in difficult situations. One verse I love and one book I love and I'm beginning to love is the story of Job. He was a man that was wealthy. He had everything. If we say there was, he had a thousand of everything that is needed. But when trouble came, it was a thousand problems. Today you may be saying, hey, I'm out of a job. I lost my income. I lost a loved one in this pandemic. Surely God does not love me or there is nothing I can do with the word. Can you imagine Job? The, I mean, it says the messengers came one after the other before the bad news could be finished to be delivered. There was another one. How did he handle it? The Bible says he cursed the day he was born, but not God. And he said, naked I came, naked I went. Lord, you gave and you can take it away. And we know the ending. In the end, he was given back everything because he did the word. He acted on the word. So today I ask you, every time you listen to the word of God, what impression is God living in your life? How will you show for it that God is in your life through his word? How will you tell us or let us know that indeed you have the experience with the master? If you want to make him your Lord and Savior, if you want to experience this faithfulness that we are talking about, it's time to put the word to work. It is time for you to make a deliberate step that you are going to change something in your life. So as I said, it's seven day conference. That means seven action plans at the end of this conference. And I tell you, when you put the word to work in practical ways, you will never forget. You may forget what somebody says to you, but you will never forget the feeling or that first impression you have with somebody. And I pray for us today that this word will not just fall on deaf ears, that we will not be the listener that Paul is rebuking, but that we are one that takes hold of the word and runs with it in practical ways that people can see it from our conduct. God wants to leave an impression on you. The question is, are you ready? And now we will cross over to, the, uh, to our apostle for the men word.
Good afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Captain and the crew, I'd like to welcome you on board this flight to Sulawesi. Flight time will be approximately one hour. The flight cruise level of 17,000 feet. Welcome to the, the Experience Conference. We are departing Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia for Zambia. Our speaker is on standby. Be blessed as you hear the word of God. The Experience 2021 presents the beloved Apostle Felix Mwamba. Apostle Felix is a teacher of God's Word and a herald of God's Kingdom. He is the lead minister at Kingdom Commissioners International Church, a kingdom-focused ministry that is based in Solwezi, Zambia, whose mission is to reveal Jesus Christ and His Kingdom to the nations of the world. His mandate is to herald God's kingdom until Christ is enthroned in every context and civilization. His passion is to see that believers in the body of Christ are mature, accurate, and united. Among other events, Apostle Felix also hosts interdenominational meetings dubbed Kingdom Orientation on a monthly basis and the annual Global Kingdom Conference. By God's grace, his ministry is attested with miracles, signs and wonders, and other mighty manifestations of the Holy Spirit. He is married to Prophetess Eunice Mwamba, a fellow minister of the Gospel, and together they are blessed with two beautiful children, Joel and Zoe. Ladies and gentlemen, viewers of the Experience 2021, join us in welcoming Apostle Felix Mwamba. joy to be here. Welcome to the Experience 2021. I should believe that by this time you have been blessed by other ministers that came before me. We celebrate the grace of God at work mightily in this conference. I want to take time to appreciate God for our hosts, Pastor David and uh, Teresa Mono, for putting up this powerful conference at such a time as this. And we also wish to take time to appreciate God for our parents, the overseers, the visionaries of this great work, Christian Life Center, that is Bishop Dr. Mono and Pastor Tina. We appreciate God for you, sir and ma, and we want you to know that we love you so very much. Praise the Lord. So thank you so much, Malaysia family, and our family in Zambia, KCIC, it sends greetings to you, and greetings from my beloved wife, Eunice. Praise the Lord. There are so many things that the Lord would want us to do in this great conference, and there are so many things that He's teaching us. And at this hour, I want us to take time to just prepare our hearts in prayer in a minute or so. Let us pray. Father, we exalt your holy name. We thank you for what you are doing. We appreciate your grace. We appreciate your presence. Thank you for this mighty visitation. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for the investment of your spirit. We submit ourselves unto you once again, that you may help us. Cleanse our eyes. Help us to see. Help us to know the truth. Grant us wisdom. Help us to stand. Help us to speak by understanding and precision. In the name of Jesus, we pray that by your word, cleanse us, sanctify us. Lord, raise an army across the nations of the world. Every person that is watching us all over the world. We pray that your presence will touch them. In the name of Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Amen and amen. 
So I love COC family very, very much because of so many, so many reasons. But among them, I want to just cite a few before we get into the message to help us to understand the journey that we are taking today by the Spirit of God. I love COC because of uh, the love. Just the love is overwhelming. The excellence, you know, the, the peace, the maturity of the ministry. And that is all because of uh, the, the authority that is in the ministry. The Bishop, Dr. Mono and Pastor Tina, that have modeled, you know, an accurate life before us. And for that we celebrate God for them. There are several reasons that I may not be able to quantify in this message. However, I'm going to zoom in into one particular reason why I love this family so much. Because of the name, Christian Life Center. Christian Life Center. And that is where we're going to derive wisdom by the Spirit of God to gain understanding into what the Lord wants us to do. So we're going to look at the Christian life. The Christian life. Praise the Lord. You know, it is when we understand this message that we can really be able to understand our theme scripture. And our theme scripture is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse 9. The Bible says, God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship, into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is where we are standing. For us to be able to understand the mysteries embedded in, that, in this powerful scripture, which I thank God for our Father, the Bishop, for you know, hearing from God and giving us this direction for this year, that it is a season of experiencing God's faithfulness. And we are going to learn in this message just how we can experience that faithfulness and how God is faithful. You see, we came into the kingdom, and the kingdom operates by mysteries, operates by principles. It doesn't operate by emotions. So if you are going to, you know, be an enterprising believer, a believer who has results, you are going to do so by engaging the laws of the kingdom, the kingdom fundamentals that help us to experience the faithfulness of God. But before we get there, we are going to establish the fact that God is faithful. I want to tell you that our Father God is a faithful God. And that word faithful in that scripture is a Greek word pistos. It means he's trustworthy. He's a God that is trustworthy. He's trustworthy in his deeds. He's trustworthy in his words, in his covenants, in his promises. We see him as a faithful God. So many dynamics for us to look at. But every believer that comes into the kingdom must first believe and understand the God to whom he has come. That this God that we've come to is a faithful God. If this God, for him, in his part or on his side, we can establish that he cannot lie. We have seen it in the scriptures. In the book of Titus chapter number 1, verse number 2, the Bible says, God cannot lie. When you go further in Hebrews 6, 18, Numbers 23, 19, it is impossible for God to lie. This God that you've come to cannot lie. He cannot swindle you. He cannot swindle anyone. Everything that oozes out of him, oozes out of goodness, is the embodiment of goodness, is the definition of goodness. Everything that comes from God is good. Why is that so? One may ask. Why is that so? It is because of his stature. Because of who he is. Who is this God? We need to zoom into that aspect. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah, chapter number 42. Isaiah 42. We take just a shot from there, and then we continue. I believe that the Lord is going to do a wonderful work in your life, and something will be birthed by the Spirit of God in your life. And after this conference, I believe as you submit to the process in the kingdom, you are going to experience the, the faithfulness of God, which is demonstrated in so many ways. His goodness through his deeds, through his word, through his covenants. Praise the Lord. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse number 8. The Bible says, I am the Lord. That is my name. That is my interest just for this, this message. I am the Lord. That is my name. So we need to understand who this God is. He begins to introduce himself to us. For us to be able to understand who he is. He says, I am the Lord. 
That is my name. Now, for us to really understand the context in which this scripture was put, we need to travel back in antiquity to understand the original writings. For us to know what the author was trying to explain to us, this prophetic author, expressing to us, to us the heart of God. I am the Lord, that is my name. We begin with the word name. It says, I am the Lord, that is my name. The word name there is a Hebrew word, Shem. It, it, it's called, you know, it talks about a position. It explains to us a position. Just like maybe, I can give an example. On earth, maybe when you have children, uh, you give a name to your child, and you maybe call them Moses, or you call a child, this is Taylor. That name is used for identification. Very different from what the scripture is bringing out in this, in this particular scripture. In this particular scripture, the word name talks about a position. A position, a stature, a status. You know, for example, if you have a confrontation with anyone, maybe on the street or at work, and then they ask you a question to say, do you know who I am? Or do you know who you are talking to? At that juncture, they are not asking you to take an investigation into what their name is. They are actually asking you to take an interest in understanding who they are, their status in society. This is the perspective in which this scripture was put. The Bible says, I am the Lord. That is my status. That is my position. That is my stature in the spirit. And in any realm, I am the Lord. That is my name. Now, the word Lord there is also a word of interest. It is the word Jehovah. Jehovah can only, is a word that can only be ascribed to, to God. Not to any other being, not to any other thing. It can only be ascribed to God. Jehovah means a self-existent one. A God who exists on his own, the eternal one. The one who gives essence to all things in this life. He's the one who gives meaning to life. That's the name Jehovah. So he says, I am Jehovah, I'm the eternal one. That is my status. This is what makes it impossible for him to lie because he's eternal. His nature does not permit him to lie or to do any ill. There's no evil in him. Everything that is, he does is righteous, is just by nature. He is a good God. And also to, to go further, as Jehovah is also a king. The Bible says in the book of Psalm, chapter number 22, verse 28, the Bible talks to us concerning him. He says, the Lord is the governor among the nations. He is the owner of the kingdom. He is the governor among the nations. He is the ruler among the nations. Is governor, and he rules from that stature of him being the highest, of him being Jehovah. Nobody can be called Jehovah, only him can be called Jehovah, because that is his position, that is exclusive to himself. In the same scripture in the book of Isaiah 42, verse number 8, you see that even glory, the praise, the honor, cannot be ascribed to any other, but only unto him, because it's only him who has that position. Praise the Lord. It is because of those dynamics that it is impossible for him to lie because of his nature, his righteous nature. He is Jehovah. He cannot lie. He cannot swindle you. It is impossible for him to lie. Praise the Lord. Very, very important for us to understand that. Because of our theme scripture, the Bible says God is faithful. God is trustworthy. It means God cannot lie. What he tells you, he will bring it to pass. What he said in your life, he will bring it to pass. There are other conditions that we are going to look at, other dynamics in the kingdom that we will look at, that will help you to walk practically in the faithfulness of God. But for us to do that, we need to take another a very important snapshot in the Bible. In the book of Acts chapter number 11, since we are looking at the Christian life, the Christian life, we are going to take a snapshot from Acts chapter number 11, verse 26, where we see the saints, the believers, first being called Christians at Antioch. Why were they called Christians? It's not that they went around with placards parading themselves as Christians. The land in which they went, people were not worshipping this God. They were not worshipping Jehovah. They began, the people, the natives of the land, the natives of Antioch, looked at these people. They had a different character. They were portraying the life of Christ. They were revealing Christ in that environment. When they looked at them, all they could see was Jesus Christ. So they gave them a name. These are Christians. 
because they look like Christ. By extension, it means they are small Christs. They are a revelation of Christ. Through them, we are able to see this Jesus Christ. So they gave them a name, Christians. So what I love, that's why I was saying that I love Christian Life Center. Because it's a place where the life of a Christian is taught. Life in the kingdom. Life of this person called a Christian is taught here. When you stay long enough, you're going to discover yourself. Discover yourself, who you are in God. What God has called you to. Praise the Lord. Now, what helps them to portray this life? There's a mystery about them. There's a mystery about them. The Bible tells us something in the book of Hebrews chapter number 12. Let's turn there. Hebrews 12, verse number 1 and 2. That is the mystery we want to see. We are setting ground for us to launch out, for us to be able to understand this faithfulness of God and how we can experience it, how we can walk in reality in this faithfulness. You know, one of the days, some time back, I was praying and, um, you know, the Lord began to minister to me. And uh, he was giving me an insight, like a message from among the people around us. And I could perceive that there are brethren among us that were complaining and inquiring from God why things were taking long or why things were not happening the way they wanted them to happen. Among them were people who were bitter with God. And the Lord began to inspire me to teach them concerning the goodness of God, how that is a good God. And we took a journey in the spirit to investigate those matters. I want to tell you the same thing that God is a good God. God is a faithful God. He cannot swindle you. His nature does not permit him to do that. It's an impossibility. In him, it is not possible for him to lie. It's impossible for him to lie. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And the Bible says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The Bible is giving a picture, like a stadium-like scenario. People are running in a race. It says, if you are in this race, you have to put your buckets behind. The sin, the weights, you have to put them behind. You lay them off so that you can run with endurance the race that is set for you. You see, that is a, one of the metaphors used for a Christian in the Bible. The, the Christian is seen as a, a soldier, is seen as an athlete, and other metaphors. So in this case, is seen as an athlete. Verse number two, the Bible is giving us further instruction that as you lay down your weight and you are running, there is a place where you must look. The Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus, that as you run your race as a believer in this life, there is a place you must look, and you must look to Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author, and finish of our faith. And when you study that word, looking unto Jesus, critically in the Greek, it actually means looking away unto Jesus. That as a believer, you have to remove your eyes from anything that may distract you from running a straight race. And you fix your gaze on Jesus. Why Jesus? Jesus came as our example. He came to reveal unto us life, in the kingdom. There were two options after the fall of man. Either to take one of us from the earth and take them into heaven to teach them the culture and life of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, or bring a man from heaven, bring them down here to show us the life and culture of heaven. God brought Jesus in the likeness, in our likeness, the likeness of men. With eyes that you can see, you could see Jesus if you were there at that time. He had flesh and blood, just like us. He had to partake of the same nature like us. And this is the same Jesus that came to model a life and culture of the kingdom before us. The Bible says we should look unto him. We should look unto him. That is a powerful instruction. It's just like you, you, you have a scientist using his microscope to zoom into a particular field of a sample that they want to study. You see, so we are to zoom into Jesus to check some mysteries about him. What made him unique? The reason we need to look at him, he is our syllabus. He is our progress. He says, I'm the way, 
the truth and the life. I'm the progress. I'm the progressive part. Any man who wants to live in this kingdom must learn to, live, to look unto Jesus. To look like him. That is why even the offices, the ministry offices that the Lord has instituted, each ministry office led us to raise the believers into that stature. Into the fullness of Christ. He is our syllabus. He is the reason why we live. He is Alpha, He is Omega. He is the beginning, He is the end. He is the one that we look at for everything in our Christian journey. So the Bible says, looking unto Jesus. We are going to check some mysteries about Jesus. You see, when I look at Jesus in His earthly life, there are many mysteries that we may not have time to study in this particular message. But we are going to just pick one important mystery which I believe looks to me as the mother and or the major of all the mysteries that he was operating by. This is something that we want to zoom into him and when we study it, we are going to discover what it is. For example, I was wondering what made him, when we study life about him in the book of Mark, Mark is an action-packed book, so different from other Gospels. It reveals Jesus as a servant, as a man working, working, it begins with action and continues with continuous action up to the end. The first miracle you see him standing in the temple. He's given a Torah. He begins to read in the book of Isaiah. And he's, as he stands there, he's teaching mysteries. The Bible says he was teaching as one having authority and power. To an extent that there was a man in that congregation as he was teaching, the power of God was so powerful, so mighty in the place. That the, the demoniac just rose up and began to cry. We know you, Jesus, you are the Son of God. Something was unique about him. His ministry was different from that of the Pharisees. Very different. That he, he became like a spectacle. Everyone could look at him and gaze. They marveled and they said, What manner of doctrine is this? What kind of teaching is this? Everyone was surprised. What made him to be so powerful that his words would cast out a demon? When you study further, you jump to chapter number 4. You see him telling his apostles, let us go to the other side. On the way, they meet a storm. He was fast asleep, relaxed. What made him to relax like that? They began to wake him up, to shake him. Master, don't you care that we are perishing? We are about to die. He rose up and as a man, he stretched his hand over the sea and he commanded it to come down. What was the mystery at work in him? What made him to be so powerful that, that he could speak to nature? One time he cursed a tree and it withered. The following day they came, they found it dry by the roots. The disciples were wondering, what manner of man is this? This is very strange. They had never seen it. So many powerful, powerful testimonies that we see in the life of Jesus. As they went on that sea, they crossed into the land of the Gadarenes. They meet a man who was mad. For many years, the Bible says, nobody could tame him. They tried to chain him. He could not be tamed. He could break those chains. He began to live in tombs, in captivity. No one could tame, could tame him. Until Jesus came on the scene, that man, without any way, ran towards Jesus and worshipped him, bowed down before him, and Jesus casted out those devils from him. The devils could recognize him, and they said, we know you, you are Jesus, the Son of God, have you come to torment us? What made him that powerful? What made him to be like that? Because of the power that was revealed in that place, the people of the land could not contain it. They chased him from the land. He went the other side, back home. He's reaching, he finds a, a great multitude. Jairus has a situation. His daughter is at the verge of death. He wants to seek help from the master. He comes to Jesus. Jesus, help me. My daughter is about to die. Just as Jesus is about to start moving, in the midst of the crowd was a woman who had an issue of blood. The Bible says she spent all that she had on physicians. So that she, she was looking for help. The Bible says she grew worse. But that day, the Bible says in the midst of the crowd, she pressed in and touched the hem of his garment. 
Jesus never offered a prayer. A woman only touched the hem of his garment. And that situation was solved instantly. The Bible says the fountain ceased immediately. And the woman knew within herself that something has happened to me. Jesus was no ordinary man. He was no ordinary man. So we see him. We see him just appearing in that crowd. So many people. The woman touched him. A miracle happened. Such a marvelous testimony. Just as Jairus was crying for help, crying for help, we see that Jesus began to say, Oh, all right, let me go and heal your child. I will go to your home. I will come and heal her. Jesus goes to the house. He finds so many people there. Chases them out for their lack of unbelief. He just reaches there. He tells them to say that this child is not dead. She is sleeping. What manner of man is this? He speaks a word to the girl in the midst of the mockery from the people. He says, Talita, call me. And the young lady came up, rose again from the dead. Life was given to her again. What manner of man? What was the mystery behind his life? What was the mystery? What made him to operate like that? Is it that God cannot answer prayers like that today? What is the problem? Why can't we see such wonders, such signs in mighty, mighty manifestations, in great supply? What is the issue? The Lord will help us. You see, because we are saying God is faithful. We see God being revealed in the life of Jesus as a faithful God. You see, in the Old Testament, God was revealed in so many types and shadows. Some saw him as Jehovah Rapha, the healer. Some saw him as Jehovah Jireh. Some saw him as Jehovah Mekadishkan. When Jesus came, he came as an, embodiment, as an embodiment of the Father, the revelation of the Father. We saw all those dimensions being revealed through his life and ministry. That is why we were able to see these miracles happening. It was a revelation of the Father. The exact manifestation of the Father. There were mysteries in his life which we need to study for us to know that indeed God is faithful because he was faithful in the life of Jesus. That Jehovah Rapha that we saw in the Old Testament that Isaiah talked about was made manifest in Jesus. We see him as Rapha, literally healing. We see him. In literal action, we see him. He was so faithful, trustworthy. You see, when you look at Jesus, he came, he had to strip off. The Bible says he did not cling to his divinity. He decided to be a man in every form so that he can qualify to set us free from sin, to pay for our sin. So it means he became a man. The father had to be faithful to him. He banked on the word of the father to say, when I become a man and I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, the Father on the third day will resurrect me. He banked on the word of the Father. That is how much he trusted the word of the Father. That's what we are saying that God is faithful. He's able to keep his way. So Jesus trusted the Father. That's why he had to pass through. All that he passed through. Because of his confidence in the Father. Praise the Lord. So many mighty, mighty, mighty miracles that we see. If you see in Mark chapter number 7, we see him. Another testimony of a deaf, deaf and a dumb man. Jesus ministers to him. And he says, a father. And the man's ears pop open. His dumbness disappears. He's healed. What was the secret of Jesus? The Bible says, looking unto Jesus. That is what we are looking at here. We need to replicate the same life for us to be able to see the faithfulness of God. It is possible for God to be faithful to us the same way he was faithful to Jesus. It is possible for us to see the miracles, the signs, the wonders. We can speak to situations and things can change. If only we can understand the mystery behind these things that were happening in the life of Jesus. I can tell you that God is faithful. Now, many questions arise because some people believe that these things ended with Jesus or these things ended with the early church. These things ended with the apostles. Is it really true? True. What about the
the words that our Lord taught us, the words that he gave us. He said, greater works than this shall he do, because I go to the Father. What about his words? Was he lying or was he choking when he told us? What about the things we see in the apostles? These men became so mighty that some of them, their shadow could even cast out demons. Men like Peter could move on in the streets. Their shadow could heal people. There were men like you and me. In Acts 3, he was so bold to stand and just speak to this man who was crippled. He said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give unto you. What made them so bold? What was so mis mysterious? What was the mystery about them? What is the back end of this, this kind of life? This is what we are living the Christian life. We need to understand what is at play, what makes it possible for our words to have power, like the words of Jesus. Power to speak to nature. Power to speak to situations. Power to cast out devils. Power to give life to the day. What is the back end? What is the mystery? What is the principle at work? What is the law at work? Like we said, we came into the kingdom and we became born again. So we need to understand the mystery at play. This kingdom operates by mysteries. It operates by principles. And by the grace of God, I want to show you the principle by which you can function so that you, the next time you meet a situation, you'll be able to speak and there'll be a result. Because I have seen these things in my life. I have stories that I can tell you from my life. I have seen them in the scriptures and I have seen them in my life. In this short journey that I have lived and I am still living, I have seen so many, so many wonders, so many miracles. What about men like Stephen? Have you ever wondered how they lived? I have testimonies I can share with you. I remember many years ago when I just got born again, about two months after salvation, I, I went to church, I was praying and fasting, seeking the Lord. Seeking the Lord at church. And as I was going back after prayer, I, I heard that my own uncle, one of the days, was going for work. And as he was coming out of the house, he met up with a cat just outside. As he saw the cat, as they looked at each other, my uncle fell down and he became paralyzed. Half of his body became paralyzed. I heard that story. At about two months after salvation. But I read something in the scripture that my God is faithful. My God is powerful. I went back to my uncle after two days. To check on him. And I told him to say, uncle, the Lord will heal you today. And I held his hand. The side that was paralyzed. And I began to pray for him. I began to pray for him in the name of Jesus. I saw my uncle, he began to shake on that bed. He shook so much. He held me, the hand that was paralyzed. And I told him, uncle, in the name of Jesus, be healed. And he stood up that day and began to walk. Up to today, my uncle walks. I have seen those miracles. I remember many years ago when I was in college, I was invited to this particular church. I was not a minister of the night. But I will never forget that testimony. As I entered the church going for an overnight, I was 23 years old at that time. As I entered the church, I saw the glory of God. I saw something glittering in the church and the words written the, to the glory of God. And I heard a voice telling me, tonight you will see my glory. And as I sat into that meeting, I began to feel the burden of the Lord for the people. At that time, there were people in front that needed prayer, that they had called for prayer. The pain of the Lord continued to intensify all my life. I couldn't hold it. I began to shake. I began to shake where I was seated. I had to ask for permission from the person who invited me to say, I want to say something. I believe the Lord wants to do something tonight. And they gave me a chance. As I went in front, I told them about the power in the name of Jesus. As I stood there, I watched the so many people that came rushed in front for prayer. 23 years old, I turned behind to pray for them. Upon turning, just turning, facing them, the power of God moved so mightily that those with devils began to cry out and devils began to leave them. Prayed for them one by one and we saw great wonders. But attention is drawn to this particular young lady. When you look at her, she was standing with crutches, standing with the mother. 
And the mother began to cry together with the daughter, lamenting how that the community is laughing at them because the daughter is now lame. I don't know what happened, but if there was an accident or something. So she, they were both lamenting as they, they hugged each other. They were explaining this, this situation that was a horror. And as I heard the testimony, and as I saw the situation, my humanity came in. I felt so scared to pray for her. How will I do it? I've never faced this kind of a situation. She was physically lame. You could see even some, I don't know what they call them in, med in medical science, some, some iron bars to help align the leg. I saw them stood there in front of we have living, living witnesses today. You see, came to this young lady and I looked to heaven. At that point, I, the, the church was staring at me. They wanted to know, really, if something is going to happen. What is this young man doing? Ah, I had to look to the Lord. And I remember singing the song by Don Moyer. You are the Lord that heals me. You are the Lord, my healer. At that moment, I felt the faith of God take over my spirit. And I was energized. And I went to the legs. And I said, in the name of Jesus, born to born, join my God, I don't know what happened, but I know something. Jesus touched her. Touched her. A miracle happened. And I said, young lady, walk. And she began to walk and run all over the podium. The whole congregation rose up in applause to celebrate the miracle. Almost hailing me like a deity. And I refused. I refused. At that moment, I said, if anyone wants to receive this Jesus, come to the front. Almost 50% of that congregation came in front to receive this living Jesus. So I have testimonies like this. I can tell you story after story. I have prayed for brothers, sisters whom I saw attacked when, whilst I was still staying in a different location in, in, in our country, at the, in the capital city. I saw some of them falling as if they would pray for them. They came back to life. Several of them in our company. I can tell you story after story in my life that this God is good. This God is faithful. But one thing I need to mention to you, there is a back end. There is a reason why those things happen. Because not everyone is walking in those dimensions. Not everyone is walking in that reality. And this day I want to show you that you can speak to things, you can speak to that situation and something can change. If only you understand how the Christian life the Christian life. There's a way that we are called to live as believers. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord, somebody. What is the answer? What is the situation? What is the mystery behind this kind of life? Let us go to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter number 8, verse 5. And as we go into this insight, I pray that you will receive it. And that you will begin to live by it in the name of Jesus. Matthew 8, verse number 5. The Bible says, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. This is the centurion, a military man. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. But only speak a word, and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does. Then Jesus, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, As surely I said to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Let's jump to verse number 13. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. There are mysteries that the centurion revealed unto us. 
This centurion was a military man. He was serving under Caesar. Caesar was far in Rome. The centurion was in Israel. He was submitted under the authority of the Caesar. And anyone who looked at the centurion was under law to follow the orders of the centurion. Because the centurion was under authority. He understood how authority works in the kingdom. And to him, that's the exact thing that he saw in the life of Jesus. He saw that Jesus, for him to do the miracles that he was doing, he was not operating by himself. He was operating by authority. And we see that as proof in the book of John chapter 5, verse 19 and verse 30. Jesus was living under the authority of the Father. And everything that he did, he never did without the authority of the Father. The mystery behind his life was spiritual authority. He was living a life under authority. So the life of every believer is called to live under authority. Under authority. The authority of God. That is what we are called to live. Let's zoom into the theme scripture. Let's zoom into the theme scripture. I believe that as you understand this, the Lord shall help us in Jesus' name. First Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 9. The Bible says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, God is faithful by him, by whom you were called into the fellowship. That word, word fellowship is the word koinonia. It means partnership. It means participation. We have been called into the participation of the life of Christ. The same life, the same dimensions of Christ. We have been called as believers to reveal them into the nations of the earth. And this is what the church did, the men who went to Antioch, they began to reveal the life of Christ. When men looked at them, they could see that these ones look like Jesus. These ones are Christians. These ones are small Christ. The same thing that we are called to reveal. The same thing that we are called to do. We are called into a partnership, into a participation. We are called to participate in the realms of Christ, in this earth. But the Bible says, this Jesus Christ is our Lord. That word Lord is a Greek word, kurios. It means supreme ruler, master. That is the condition. That is the authority part. For a believer to participate in the realms of Christ, they must submit under this governor, the governor of the kingdom, Jesus Christ. He is the monarch of Zion. He is the one that was, you know, enthroned in heaven as the king of kings and the lord of lords. It is to him that we must all submit. When we submit, then we begin to see his life revealed through us. His dimensions revealed through us. Have you ever wondered why Psalm 23 tells us the good things that we see? It says, my cup will not run over. How do in the house of the Lord forever and ever? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What will you not want? Just from verse number 2 coming down it begins to tell you the effects of this one it says the lord is my shepherd the word shepherd is the word Rahab. it means he's my lord he's my master he's the one who shepherds me he shows me the way he tells me where to go what to do that is the life of a christian the life of a christian is called to live under christ every believer every person was called to live under that great monarch jesus christ when we live under him, then we can see his results. When we live under him, then we can see his dimensions revealed through us. When we live under him, then we can see his life manifested in our world, in various territories. Then we can speak like him. Then we can preach like him. Then we can live like him. Then we can speak to nature. It is the level of our submission to that authority that determines the authority that we wield. Because what happens is that when we submit to him, he gives us the same authority. Direct proportion to our level of submission. In practice, I mean, it's easy for anyone to say, I belong to Jesus. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Savior. But we are talking about practical life. That as a person, as a believer, in practice, you live as a man under authority like Jesus. This was the secret of the apostles. This was the secret of the early church. These were men who were living under the authority of God. You will see that they made decisions in partnership with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the custodian of the authority of God in the earth today. He's the one that was sent to represent the interests of the throne of Christ. 
is the one that was sent to represent the kingdom of heaven in the earth. He is the chief executive of the kingdom. No party can function without the Holy Ghost. If someone begins to operate without that, that authority, then they become victims. Then their words cannot have power. Then they cannot see the faithfulness of God. To see the faithfulness of God, you must understand that Jesus Christ is our Lord. And the Holy Spirit has been sent to represent Jesus Christ. When we submit to him and begin to live by his laws, by his standards, we begin to see his house. We begin to see his power. We begin to see his dimensions. That was a secret in the lives of the apostles. You see that in Acts 15, they could even make decisions with the Holy Ghost. The Bible says, it, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. They had a board meeting to solve a doctrinal issue in the church. They made decisions together with the Holy Ghost. It is the Holy Ghost who could send them on errands for ministry, Acts chapter number 13. The Holy Ghost had power to even forbid them from entering certain territories, Acts 16 verse 6. He could stop them from going somewhere. When the Holy Spirit becomes powerful like that in your life, that he can stop you from making certain decisions, then you begin to see the dimensions of Christ. You begin to see the faithfulness of God, that when you speak, your words will carry power. Because many believers, you know, today, they say, no, God takes time, or maybe things are not happening. When they speak, things are not happening. What is the problem? It's the level of submission. There's a dimension of the Holy Spirit, the operation of the Spirit of God that is only given to those who obey the Holy Spirit. Acts number 5, verse 32. There's a dimension given to those who live in submission to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a spirit. He cannot function without believers. In the book of Psalm, chapter number 110, 110 from verse number 1, to verse number four. Let's read it as we are running towards the climax and the end of this great insight, even in this conference. We believe that the Lord is going to do something new in your life as you take heed to the word of the Lord. The book of Psalm, chapter number 110. The Bible says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, Till I make your enemies your footstool. It's the same scripture Peter quoted when he was explaining Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. When Peter was explaining what happened, because what happened was a sign, a representation of what was happening in heaven. So Peter was explaining to us what actually was transpiring in the realm of the Spirit that Jesus was just enthroned as king in heaven. And then the Holy Spirit has been sent. So the Bible says in verse 2, The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. That's the Holy Ghost, the rod of the strength of God. Verse number 3 says, Your people shall be willing, shall be volunteers, shall be willing in the day of thy power. Thy people shall be willing. Thy people shall be willing. So there is that partnership. The Holy Spirit is the road of the strength of God sent out of Zion with the authority of God. So he has been sent to represent the interests of the kingdom in the earth. But he cannot operate alone. He looks for partners. He looks for men that he can empower so that when you stand in the name of Jesus, in your family you can speak a word if you are submitted to him and something will change. These are dynamics that causes our ways to have power. How come some believers are powerful? Some are not. These are the dynamics. Submission to the authority of God by the Holy Ghost. Says Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is our master. He is our curious. He is the one who tells us where to go. He is the one who tells us what to do. What decisions to make in life. If the Holy Spirit can be powerful in your life like that, that he can stop you, that he can make you to go somewhere, then you begin to see his life flow through your life. You begin to see dimensions. You begin to see the faithfulness of God. You begin to see that indeed Jehovah is Jehovah Rapha. You begin to see that Jehovah is the healer. Is the healer. You begin to see that Jehovah can provide. Even in a desert, you begin to see him that this God can even part the Red Seas. Those are the conditions. 
it is the level of your submission to that authority that will determine the level of God's authority that will be revealed through your life, which is a manifestation of his faithfulness to his word, because he's faithful. When Jesus said that greater works than these shall you do, he meant it. It wasn't a joke. But whether you see the greater works or not is dependent on your level of submission. That is why every man must be born again. Every person must submit to that great throne. And when you begin to live that life, submitting yourself to that throne of Christ, submitting yourself to the Lordship of Christ, by the Holy Ghost, you begin to see the manifestation of Christ. The Bible says we are according to the fellowship of Jesus Christ. We are according to the fellowship, participation. We are called to participate, koinonia, into the realms of Christ. But you must understand, this will only be a reality if you submit to the authority of Christ. I want to tell you a short story. Many years ago, I was in college. And um, I think that time, uh, I was studying agribusiness management. And um, I remember one of the days, I, I heard that uh, the military was recruiting the Air Force in our country. And the way I love the Air Force so much, I had to take my application. And uh, they looked at my papers after I struggled to enter. They looked at them and they, they loved my papers. And they said, well, tomorrow come for medicals. The following day, I, I was to go for medicals. When I went back home, deep in the night, I saw the Lord come to me. And he spoke to me authoritatively. He said, this is not what I've called you to. I know where I'm taking you. Trust me. My God. He said, I know where I'm taking you. Trust me. That morning, I could not rise up to go and finish my application. I was almost picked to go and, you know, to take over that military career. But the Holy Spirit stopped me. He said, this is not what I've called you to. I know where I'm taking you. Trust me. He is faithful. And I can tell you that he has proved himself faithful in my life. And he has continued to do so. He never left me alone. If the Holy Spirit can be that powerful in your life that he can stop you. That he can guide you. That the Lord can become your shepherd. He can tell you what to do. He can tell you where to go. He can tell you where not to go. Like the apostles. The Bible says the Holy Spirit forbade them from going into that tent. If you can have that life, I tell you, then you can operate under his authority. You can speak and you will see him faithful to his word. You can see him that God indeed is the same yesterday, today and forever. If you can live that kind of life. If you can live that kind of life. Which is only possible if you submit to the Holy Spirit. When you do so, he will help you. One of the days, many years ago, I, I was staying with my friend and I just discovered that my friend had measles, very contagious disease. And I was taking care of him. By the time I was taking care of him, I didn't know that that disease had come to me. A few days later, I checked in the mirror. I developed same symptoms. I saw rash on my face. I saw sores in my mouth. Same symptoms I saw on my friend. I, what did I do? I had to lock myself up in the room. I began to pray intensely. Two hours I prayed. Having a revelation that Christ is my life. And as I prayed, after that time, I checked myself in the mirror. I found all those symptoms that disappeared. Physically gone. And I can tell you from my life that God is faithful. He still heals. He still raises the dead. I've seen it in my life. He still opens blind eyes and he can help you. If you can agree to live under his government, to be ruled by him, if your life can be run by Jesus, you see the idea of the kingdom is that Christ must become the center of our lives, not a part of our lives. The idea is not that Christ must be a part of our lives. The idea is that Christ must be the center of our lives. Those are two different things. Something can be a part of your life, but it's not the center. For example, you can, maybe a gym. You usually go for gym after work. You gym and then you go home. It's part of your life. Gym is part of your life, but it's not the center of your life. You can do without the gym. But when we say something is the center of your life, that is where you derive your essence. 
That is what is driving you. That is what is moving you. That is the motivation of your life. That is what the Lord wants us to be. He wants us to have Jesus as the center of our lives. Didn't you see in the Old Testament the pattern, how they stayed, how they lived, the children of Israel in the, in the desert. The Bible says the, the Ark of Covenant was in the middle and the temple right in the middle and all the tribes of Israel lived around that Ark representing the presence of God. God was to be the center of their lives. That is how a believer ought to be. And in these last days, the Lord is raising such kind of people. God is bringing a mighty revival across the nations of the earth. I was in prayer, praying for this conference, and I heard the Lord began to speak unto me concerning this end time harvest. He said the Holy Spirit is going around the nations of the world, looking for men that he can partner with. You know, one of the days when I was praying, what he told me, he said, look into church history. The things are done. The things are done through different great generals of faith. He said, these are not the only things that I can do. There are many more things I can do. It just depends on your submission. Men who can be available for the kingdom business, the Lord can use them. He can raise you from the sheep cult like David. He can raise you to become a man who wields authority for the kingdom. And you are going to see that indeed God is faithful. You are going to see the manifestations of Christ through your life. You are going to see the revelation of Christ through your life. You're going to see the revelation of the kingdom through your life. God is He's looking for men that he can partner with in this end time harvest. The Lord told me to tell you as I was praying. He says he's on a search. The Holy Ghost is searching the nations of the world. Will you be among the people that will stand to bear his name? Will you be among the people that will stand to speak in his name, to take over cities for him, to take over families for him? Don't you know that if you don't submit to that authority, your family will remain bound. You need to rise up. Submit to that authority and you're going to see his power touching your family. That when you speak in your family, God will honor your way. Men who are under authority it's as if God owes them his presence. I've seen God many times just standing on the pulpit. The Lord begins to move, doing mighty wonders. And I see a great transformation in this end time church. The Lord will touch the nations of the world. I see the Lord searching in Asia. I see the Lord searching in Africa. I see the Lord searching in all parts of the world. He's looking for people. People that he can partner with. The Bible says, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Thy people shall be willing. That's one of the marks of God's people. That's the Christian life. The life of a Christian is lived under that great shepherd, Jesus Christ. And when you live under him, you're going to see his presence. You're going to see him faithful to his word. That even like in the days of old, even your shadow could heal. I've seen it before in my life. Your words, Jesus would cast out spirits by the way. Jesus would speak to inanimate things and animate things. Where are those days? Where are those days? We look for men and God looks for men of that stage. Men who can speak for him. Will you be among his people in this generation? Will you be among the people that you'll be using to touch Africa, to touch Asia, to touch the nations of the world, to touch your family? When will you be set their eyes? The Lord wants to raise you. If you can become a Christian indeed, not by name but by practice, we are men who practice Christianity. We are men who are submitted to Jesus Christ. I pray for you in the name of Jesus that you begin to submit today that as you submit to that great throne of Jesus Christ, that your life will become a revelation of Jesus. That God will be faithful to you. That as he raises you, he will lift you to become a voice in your family. To become a voice in your land. That the territories under you will be overtaken for the kingdom. That through your life, God will be faithful. God will be seen as a healer, as a deliverer. God will bring you out of any trouble. I pray for you in the name of Jesus. As you, as you make that decision to submit under him, that the Lord will use you. The Lord will help you. The Lord will touch your life. The Lord will transform your family in the name of Jesus. And as you proceed, as the Lord will continue to, to speak to you during this conference, make that decision to live under government. There is a difference between men who live under government, the government of Christ, and those who only claim to be Christians. 
I pray that as you make that decision, there will be proofs to your life. Me kopara sai kopreta kopela sale bakato. Mi so kopreta ku sevela hasa sila haria. Rikos can preta su kabalade. Father, we pray, help us in this generation. Lord, as we submit ourselves unto you, we pray. We pray for the church global that you may begin to search as a light among the nations, that you will help us to be Christians indeed, Christians by practice, Christians that will live to manifest your fullness, your faithfulness in ways, in deeds, in covenants, in promises, in the name of Jesus. Search among the nations and raise a people for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we raise Asia before you. We raise COC before you. Begin to search among the ministry and raise mighty men. We pray in the name of Jesus for Africa. We pray for every continent of the world. We pray, let your light search and raise a people unto your glory. We thank you, Father, for the great harvest in the end time church. We pray in the name of Jesus that you add temper, power, and authority to your church in these last days. Break barriers in the name of Jesus Christ. Let there be limitless growth of your church in this day and age. We give you praise, O oh great God, in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray. Amen and amen. I pray that you have been blessed by this message. I want to encourage you to take time to follow through this conference, even as we proceed. Other ministers are coming after me. Follow through the words. I want to celebrate God for you, Pastor D and Pastor T. We pray for you that the Lord will continue to use you. We will appreciate God for our father and mother, Bishop Dr. Mono and Pastor Tina Mono. We pray for them that the Lord will continue to strengthen them, to give them life, that the Lord will keep them in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The Lord bless you. Thank you so much. This is Apostle Felix Momba, all the way from Kingdom Commissioners International Church in Zambia, saying goodbye. God bless you. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Wow, what a word, what a word. Glory to God. Thank you so much, Apostle Sir, for blessing us so mightily with the word of God this day. The Christian life, the Christian life. Are you living the Christian life? Thank you so much for, for revealing Christ to us at a greater and a deeper level. Thank you so much to the whole KCIC Nation, everybody that is online, thank you so much for tuning in and um, listening to the word. I pray that you receive the word in your spirit today. See, there are those, you know, maybe you have been living your Christian life at a lesser level to that which we heard today. Now is the time for us to step up. See, now is the time to truly live the fullness of that life. See, the Bible says in 1 John let me read something. First John chapter 1. First John chapter 5, rather. Hallelujah. First John chapter 5, verse 11. The Bible says, and this is the testimony that God has given to us eternal life. That is the Christian life. That is Zoe life. And this life is in his son. And he who has the son has life. And he who does not have the son does not have life. The Apostle took time to share so many testimonies with us this evening of God's faithfulness see, and, uh, and the type of power that we have available in this life. Now, wherever you are, you know, um, please just stick with us for just five more minutes and we're going to log off. Um, but I'm late for us to pray for some people. And I can, I can see several of you online right now. Praise the Lord. I can see several of you. Let me just read out a few names. Oh, Prophetess Mwamba, we see you there. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see you there. Uh, I see you, Elizabeth, Walia, Mercy, Lucy. I, I, see, I see so many of you online. Um, but I want you to do this. You're going to, you're going to tag somebody or you're going to mention um, that condition, especially if you're sick in your body. There is healing that is going to be administered to you right now, right now, wherever you are. Perhaps you know somebody that is not well. 
See, somebody that is not well, somebody that is sick, that has got a pain in their body, they are suffering with, with a headache, they have a condition, stomach condition, they have a chest condition, you know, maybe it's, it's the virus or, you know, COVID-19 or whatever other virus or sickness, disease. Maybe it is your uncle, your auntie, maybe it is you yourself. Go ahead and just say, you know, pray for my uncle, pray for my auntie, pray for my brother, my sister. Just go ahead and just, and just type that and we're going to pray now. We're going to pray now and we're going to manifest that power right now as we pray. We've heard the word of the Lord and now we're going to bring that word into demonstration. And wherever you are right now, we are trusting the power of the Holy Spirit to minister to your body in the name of Jesus Christ. Saints all over the world, those of you that are watching me right now and your faith is high, you're going to be praying in the Holy Ghost as people are typing in. Amen. If you, if you have a condition, you have a condition or you know somebody that is sick in their body, go ahead and just, go ahead and just, and just type something. Go ahead and type there and say, uh, please pray for this person. Please pray for my uncle. Pray for my auntie, brother, sister, parents, whatever, whoever it may be. We want to pray now and we want to declare healing in those bodies in the name of Jesus. We must demonstrate this life that we have. Isaiah said, that by his stripes we are healed. He was talking a word of prophecy of the Messiah who was going to come. And he said, by the stripes that we are healed. But Peter, he had a different revelation. He says in First Peter chapter 2 verse 24, he says, by his stripes we were healed. See, because he understood that when you have the life of God in you, you are not in and out of sickness. You're not in and out of diseases. You can remain in permanent divine health. And that's what we're going to pray now. Glory to God. So in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I can see some, some have come in. Praise the Lord. And many more. Pray for my boss. Pray for my son. Pray for my sister. We're praying now in the name of Jesus Christ. For every condition, every sickness, every disease, we thank you, God, for the life that you have made available to us. And Heavenly Father, all those conditions that have been typed, and even those that have not been typed, but Father God, they are there in our world, people next to us, colleagues, family members, people in our environment that are not well. Father, we pray right now in the name of Jesus, whatever city they're at, whatever country they're at, by the word that we have just heard, the Christian life. Father, we declare healing now in the name of Jesus Christ. Healing in those bodies, healing, healing, healing now. In the name of Jesus, the divine life of the Lord is yours now by the power of the Holy Ghost. Yes, yes, we declare that every headache, every condition that has followed your generation, it ceases now in the name of Jesus Christ. Every hurting, every pain, in the name of Jesus, we declare your divine health. You are free. Yes, you are free from that sickness. You are free from that disease. You are free from that pain. In the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Receive it now wherever you are. It is yours. It is yours. In Jesus' mighty name. Oh, glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. I just, I can just, I just feel the anointing of God right here where I am in KL, Malaysia. And I know wherever you're at, maybe you're in Solwezi, Zambia, you're in Johannesburg, South Africa. Wherever you're at, you know, just begin to just enjoy his presence and just begin to receive that grace in Jesus mighty name. Once again, I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody that is online watching us today. Thank you so much for for staying and sticking around and listening to the word. Once again, I want to thank Apostle and his dear wife and his family and the whole ministry at large for your love. Thank you for all the leaders that are logged in, Christian Life Center leaders, um, departmental leaders. And I want to thank God even for our man of God, uh, Bishop Dr. Mono and Mom Pasatino Mono. We want to thank you so much for your love. Thank you so much for your prayers. Thank you for the grace, the anointing of God that is over your life. Thank you for teaching us the Christian life teaching us how to live the Christian life. And today we are, we are experiencing the faithfulness of God because of those words that were ministered through you. Thank you so much. I want to give an opportunity before we close for those that do not know Jesus. We read in 1 John 5 that this life is in his son. 
See, everything that we have talked about today, the testimonies that you heard today, you see, they only come into effect in your life when you receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. See, he came to save you. Yes, a long time ago, from sickness, from sin, from condemnation. But he has also come to be Lord over your life. See, submit everything to him. Submit your very life to him, your very being, your very time, your very resources. All unto Jesus. We are here for him. This broadcast is here for him. And if that is you today, you know, and you've never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, I want to pray for you. Or you are maybe somebody that has been called in your Christian life. We prayed for this category of people in earlier broadcasts. Perhaps your, your passion hasn't been what it's supposed to be. And today you've been inspired by the word. I want to pray for you now. I want to pray for you that that fire may be ignited again. That you go forth and manifest his life again. You manifest this grace. You enjoy the experience of his faithfulness. Pastor Fizo yesterday taught us that, that our lives are supposed to be stories of good news. Not just our lives, but we're supposed to be converting other people's lives to be stories of good news. I want to pray. I want to pray for you now in the name of Jesus. If that is you, repeat these words after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I declare in the name of Jesus, I receive your words with faith in my spirit, with gladness in my heart. Thank you for the life, the Christian life that we have been taught today. I receive that life. I believe with my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. I will live for him. Yes, I am here for him. Thank you for welcoming me into this beautiful family of the kingdom of God. I am now a child of the most high God. If you prayed that simple prayer, go ahead and send us a message. Send us an email. The details should be flashed on the screen right now. We want to pray for you. We want to pray for you. We want to guide you on this journey. We want to allocate you to a Bible teaching ministry that you may be able to grow in the faith. And we are praying for those now in the name of Jesus, those who are born again already, but those who have not been manifesting and living the Christian life, those that have been living like sinners when God has called you to be the righteousness of God. I pray for you now. I pray a return of your passion in the name of Jesus Christ. I declare by the power of the Holy Spirit that now you will arise again. You, are, you will arise and you will shine. The glory of the Lord has risen over you in the name of Jesus. Yes, in your environment, in your workplace. Yes, in your school, in your marketplace, wherever you are found. I declare the life of God will begin to manifest at a greater level in in the name of Jesus Christ. That fire returns now in Jesus' mighty name. Go now and live the life of God. Go now and manifest his presence in Jesus' mighty name. Amen, amen, and amen. Oh, glory to God. Please just go ahead and type and say God is faithful. Go ahead and say God is faithful. Go ahead and just type God is faithful as we prepare to log out today. Tomorrow we have another power-packed program. We have um, in our midst, in day four, uh, the DCMO himself, Pastor Gift Zoe, is coming and is going to be a blessing to us in the words tomorrow evening. If you are in Malaysia, tomorrow evening, 9 p.m., Central African time, 3 p.m. Glory to God. You can do the conversion wherever else you are in the world. But join us in the word. It's going to be explosive. It's going to be powerful. We have our chairman the chairman of the Men of Integrity here at CLC Malaysia, who's going to be delivering a motivation. Today we had our chair lady. Wow, what a word. Sister Linda, if you're listening, we love you so much. Thank you for preparing us to hear the word. That appetizer was more than an appetizer. God bless you so mightily. But tomorrow we're going to have an extraordinary time. It's day four of our conference coming up. Please don't miss any of these sessions. All these messages are being posted on our YouTube channel, Christian Life Center Malaysia. You can go ahead and, you know, pick up and listen and meditate to the word over and over again. And you, are, you shall surely be mightily blessed in Jesus' mighty name. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us now and forevermore. Surely, goodness and mercy 
and wealth shall run after us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. I am blessed, and my family is blessed in 2021. Go ahead and declare it. I am blessed, and my family is blessed in 2021, our season of experiencing God's faithfulness. God bless you. We'll see you in day four tomorrow. Amen.